Good morning. Welcome back to the second day of this uh, conference. And it is my honor and pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning, Professor Vina Das. Uh, I'm sure all of you who have, who are anthropology students or seasoned anthropologists or South Asianists would not have to be introduced to Professor Vina Das. But nevertheless, uh, let me just say a few words before she starts her lecture. Professor, professor Das is currently the Krieger Eisenhower Professor of Anthropology at Johns Hopkins University. Before that, before, joined, before going to the US, he was at the Delhi School of Economics uh, for almost 30 years. Professor Das has received more awards, more academic awards than I have time to list in this morning's introduction. It'll take too long to read it all out. So I will just uh, let you read the introduction in the program itself. And uh, one of the most exciting things that in a long list of research focus is the focus on everyday life and the ordinary, and the attempt to theorize from the ordinary conceptual scheme. Mm. So today, uh, and so in, this, in the context of that, she has published several books recently, Life and Words, Violence and Descent into the Ordinary, Affliction, Health, Disease, Poverty, and three co-edited volumes, of which two have already been published, the Ground Between, Anthropologists Engaging Philosophy, Living and Dying in the Contemporary World, the Compendium, and that to be published, Politics of the Urban Poor. So we will today have the pleasure of hearing Professor Das speaking about a topic in which she's passionately engaged the ephemeral, the durable, and the force of life, thinking with the ordinary. I want to start by um, thanking everyone for coming this morning and um, particularly uh, to the organizers, uh, Malini and Siddhartan for, um, for this wonderful uh, opportunity. Um, let me start by telling you a very short story about the Sufi saint who was uh, executed because he went around saying uh, there is no God. And when asked why he was saying there's no God, he said, I was actually trying to reflect on there's no God but God, but I couldn't get beyond there's no God. So in one way, uh, I'm not going to, I don't know if I'm going to get beyond um, the force of life. <laughs> I hope I'll not be executed for that. <laughs> Uh, but I think this is a very challenging, and as yesterday's um, papers showed, um, uh, you know, there's a very challenging and difficult uh, question the organization, the organizers have actually placed before us. Um, and so I'll just um, say that I've tried to take some steps into that. I'm not sure um, how successfully. Um, but you know, success is not very important. I think it's sort of important to share in in a way where the um, struggles of thought are. Uh, so I'll just say first, just very briefly, three to four um, organizing ideas behind this so that there is some sense of the architecture of the paper. Uh, I'm not going to be able to go through uh, all the ethnography because, you know, usually I like like to do very dense ethnography, um, and um, I'd be happy to answer more questions on that in the um, in the um, in the questions and answers. 
Uh, so let me just start by saying first that, um, you know, I go very much along with Wittgenstein when he says that concepts do not have sharp boundaries. That is to say, I can imagine for certain purposes that we need to think about concepts as having sharp boundaries. Um, but he has, a, you know, his, um, uh, I've elaborated elsewhere, his very long comments on um, why it is that sharpness of concepts actually fails us when it comes to questions about ethical or moral questions. Uh, Second, I want to say that, so that's why the importance of examples in Wittgenstein, and one of the things which he says very well uh, is that the diseases that we work with just one example. So what some might be see, see as a problem, like why do we have such diversity of thinking or examples in the papers, for example, that were uh, presented yesterday, I see that as a very innovative move to try and say, uh, in what kind of way can a diversity of examples actually show us how to go on, not what is common among them, but how can we actually go on. Uh, second, I think that uh, in much of my work on the ordinary, one of the very important point is, um, and this is somehow, uh, I'm, I'm clear that I haven't been able to convey this sufficiently enough uh, which is that for me, something like ordinary and everyday is not purely the default position of, um, uh, you know, routine and repetition. And that everyday life is always shadowed uh, with um, skepticism. And that one of the greatest analytical difficulties is, of course, that we can't see what is before our eyes. I mean, this is the kind of theme of the purloined letter, but this is also the theme of... Uh, much of my writing, which is to say then that we need to um, have imagination to conjure what is a picture of the everyday life. And we can have very different pictures of everyday life, but it's important to realize what kind of imagination is necessary to conjure what might be um, everyday life. Mm. Um, and I think that's what, for, for today, for example, I'm going to try and ask myself what happens when we Add, add the modification every day to life. But what is it that it actually, conjuring that, reveals in some ways to us? Uh, third, that in the second part, where this is living in precarious spaces and times in Asia, of course, time and space are not commensurate categories. They're not symmetrical categories. You can't, you know, you can add up smaller bits of space and make up a bigger space. Uh, except for public calendars, you can't add up smaller bits of time and make up a larger time. Because, you know, in some ways, there is a verticality of the moment. So it's not like some people are doing small bits and some people are doing larger bits of, you know, of time, uh, which is a very spatialized concept of time. So the moment is a very interesting thing for me. And what's, you know, I mean, if, la if society is made durable, it's not that it is durable, it has to be made durable. So what is the relation between ephemerality and durability? And lastly, because I've written a lot on, um, on forms of life from Wittgenstein, uh, one of the major things I want to say um, is that, you know, if you go back to somebody like Durkheim, uh, and you think how many times does the notion of life appear in Durkheim? Of course, it's modified very often by every, by religious life, ethical life, our cognitive life, etc. Uh, but here is a citation for us to consider. Where he says, if collective consciousness is to appear, a sui generis synthesis of individual consciousnesses must occur. The product of this synthesis is a whole world of feelings, ideas, and images that follow their own laws once they are born. They mutually attract one another, repel one another, fuse together, subdivide and proliferate. And none of these combinations is directly commanded and necessitated by the state of the underlying reality. Indeed, the life is thus unleashed, enjoys such great independence that it sometimes plays about in forms that have no aim or utility of any kind, but only the pleasure of affirming itself. I have shown that precisely this is often true of ritual activity and mythological thought. So there is a sense in which the mysteriousness of life or the playfulness of life is something which he tries mm -hmm. to 
uh, domesticate by presenting the notion of society and the notion of collective consciousness. Of course, the expression forms of life in a certain sense differs precisely in the sense that it also assumes that for life to be made visible, you would, it would have to take form. But it also assumes that form does not exhaust life. And one of my whole concerns has been to show that the notion of life in Wittgenstein is actually not purely biological life. And this is very clear, say, in the comments in Zettel where he says, uh, you know, thought is that which is alive in language. And he has this very, very clear idea that language can be dead or that words can go numb or frozen. So in that sense, the notion of aliveness or life is not limited to biological life at all in, in Wittgenstein. Uh, so the last question that I think would, uh, would, be, would be within the architecture of the paper um, is the question, um, is forms of life sufficient enough description? And I've argued that forms of life is not a conceptual schema in Wittgenstein. It's actually something that he uses in a very ordinary way. Levin's form is a very ordinary way of speaking about, um, about forms of life. And that goes along with his notion that Concepts should be made, in one of his remarks, he says that concepts should be made as ordinary as tables and chairs and lamps and so on, right? So in that sense, it seems to me that um, the issue before me that I tried mm -hmm. to think about here was whether um, the force of life, um, or I might pluralize it and say forces of life, um, does it add something? Is it something that's missing in forms of life that thinking about force might help us uh, to think further or not? And it's an open question for me, and I'll try and see why it's an open question. Okay, so I'll go to the um, uh, paper uh, proper uh, and start by uh, saying that what I'm interested in thinking about life is the notion of life as a whole, and this I've thought of in relation to questions about ethics, that what it is to say not whether this particular action is moral and ethical, but what does it mean to think about um, what Cora Diamond calls the ethical spirit, which is in relation to life as a whole. And I'll give you a very short uh, quote from her where she says, we may then think that there is thought and talk that has at its subject matter what is a good life for human beings, or what principles or actions we should accept. So then philosophical ethics will be philosophy of that area of thought and talk. And then she says, but you do not have to think that. And Wittgenstein rejects that conception of ethics. Just as logic is not for Wittgenstein a particular subject with its own body of truths, but penetrates all thought, so ethics is no particular subject matter. Rather, an ethical spirit, an attitude to the world and life, can penetrate any world and thought. So the contrast I want is between ethics conceived as a sphere of discourse, among others, in a contrast with ethics like to everything there is or can be, the world as a whole, life. So there's something very interesting in the notion of the world as a whole, because obviously the world as a whole is not the globe. I mean, it's not a place in that sense. But in what kind of way is our being in the world uh, with others to be thought of? Um, and second, that that is how she uses them interchangeably, very interestingly, the world as a whole life. So then I want to think of what is world as a whole life. And is the modification of life with the adjectival everyday, everyday life, uh, could it provide an important lens with which to take forward our notions of ethics, ethical life, etc.? Um, and I know there's been a lot of debate in anthropology around questions of whether there is a possibility of ordinary ethics. So there are people like Jared Digon who think that. Um, you know that only in moments of breakdown does ethics make itself clear. Or people like uh, Lempert, who think that you know that ethics is about once we have something in it, it's the effort to make it communicable. And my argument over here is that no, it actually suffuses whole of life, uh, and that that which is ethical can also be immediately transformed into unethical. And that's really the big uh, 
question, I think, in relation to this. So, um, so let's start by imagining the ordinary. Uh, in his essay, Being Odd, Getting Even, where he tries to work out Descartes' inheritance by the literary, as in Emerson and Poe's rendering of the question of self-knowledge, hence of skepticism, Stanley Cavell makes explicit the task of imagining what picture of intimacy, closeness, ordinariness we might conjure to think of the everyday or the diurnal. And he says, if some image of human intimacy, call it marriage or domestication, for us has become available as the fictional equivalent of what the philosophers of ordinary language understand as the ordinary, call this the image of the everyday as the domestic, then it stands to reason that the threat to the ordinary that philosophy names skepticism should show up in fiction's favorite threats to forms of marriage, namely in forms of melodrama and of tragedy. And then he goes on to ask in his book, Pursuits of Happiness, he's posing the question with regard to the picture of human intimacy as to whether a pair in romantic marriage who outside the idyllic world of Eden are likely to accumulate hurts, pains, disappointments can nevertheless remain friends. Uh, that is not a question really that you would have no friction in life, but what's the kind of thing in which you could remain friends? And his answer is a yes, expressed in their willingness to be remarried. That is, turn the disappointment into a commitment to a future together. <coughs> Through the mutual education in which the course of this togetherness or the end is not given in advance. In the case of his second book on film, Contesting Tears, the answer was a no. Since the women in these melodrama prefer a life of solitude and sometimes even touch madness in an attempt to overcome the arrogation of their voice by a dominant male figure. In everyday life, if, uh, if everyday life is a modality of living, that is if it's not something I can show you a door to enter into and then exit, then Cavell's formulation provides a very good guide to the perplexed as to what image of everyday might we conjure in order to make explicit what the labor of the achievement of everyday involves in what is it to fail in this achievement. So I uh, imagine um, over here a two, I'm going to take up two specific um, um, imageries, so to say of the everyday. One is a willing acceptance of repetition. Now this is different from the idea that repetition is something mechanical. Everyday is habituation and the second is a mode of re-inhabitation. So if we think of habituation, repetition and its undercurrents, the traditional view of habit as it is that it's a flywheel of society, its most precious conservative agent as William James put it. While one aspect of habit is certainly that is seen to fix our tastes and aptitudes, narrowing the range of the possible, as for example in Ricoeur, the emphasis on this aspect is not unrelated to the value we place on durability. That is because we value durability more and there's no explicit reason given as to why we would value durability more. Um, we, we think of habit as, um, uh, you know, as having this uh, a uh, very important aspect of actually narrowing the range of the possible. Uh, Ghassan Hagi, on the other hand, shows that habit has uh, these two aspects, that of sedimentation of experience on the one hand and a generative capacity of responsiveness to a particular milieu on the other. Um, at some length, what I've tried to show is that there's been some very interesting work to show um, that habit is not purely the place of automation in, in human life, that even within habitation you can actually show uh, something like creativity through showing what is it to be attentive to the other in the context of very everyday kinds of concerns. Um, and I stand by it. Uh, on the other hand, it's clear to me that this notion of slow um, slow changes in habit and this notion of the uh, attention to the minute, uh, in a certain sense, um, uh, I, I think what I did not get in my earlier work clearly enough um, was this idea that there is volatility uh, in habit. And I'm trying to kind of think what this volatility means in relationship to our understanding of life as a whole. 
Um, so I'll give you a little bit of ethnography. The next section is called a rotating fan, a hot summer afternoon, and the sisters complained. Uh, there's a brief episode which appears in Life and Words, Violence and the Descent into the Ordinary. It's of a woman on her deathbed saying, uh, whatever else, do not cover me in a shroud sent from my brother's house. And it's not addressed to anybody. I described how such moments when an injunction comes unbidden and unanticipated by anyone throw the relatives of a dying person in a terrible bind. Should they respect the last wishes of the person, but then dying people are known to be vulnerable to the mischief of spirits and ghosts, was it the woman's own voice that spoke? It is a terrible insult to a natal family. The main point is that it's a terrible insult to a natal family to refuse a shroud coming from uh, the natal family because it's the last indication of the connection between the brother and the sister. Um, and also the fact that the brother will inherit the obligations even though the sister is now dead. So saying in this way, whatever happens, do not let a shroud uh, come from my brother's house was a very traumatic kind of event. Um, so I... Uh, um, so I can't um, construct this, this story through any archive of lengthy uh, narrative interview, uh, uh, interviews, but because I interacted with the, the woman Sita's family for many years, I remember many instances of small talk with an underlying current of grudges she bore against her brother and his family, which would surface and disappear. I mean, the rotating fan refers to the fact that it's a very hot afternoon sitting in this room, and she said, your Uncle G, I was very young then, your Uncle G has uh, never acknowledged the fact that we gave him this fan when he actually moved to Delhi. <laughs> and there would be these very small things like, you know, she would say, uh, there were never any open fights, um, either with her brother or later with her sons. So she maintained a stance of self-sufficiency, slowly speaking, um, you know, what had happened, and I described this in some length, is that she was an affluent relative. Her husband suddenly died of a heart attack. And then from the sheen of the affluent relative, she became someone who could be dependent in, in a certain kind of way. Um, and what was very clear was that there were many stories of resentments that were woven into the texture of these relations that were on the surface, but they were marked by civility, adherence to rhythms and routines of everyday life. Only inert objects, the fan and elaborately embroidered fulkari she had crafted with her own hands, a set of cushion covers, were allowed to be brought into conversation with sense of something wrong or something not being right. So, you know, she would say, maybe the cushions are too bright for Delhi, and that's why um, my sister-in-law hides them behind other cushions. Or she'd say, maybe these days children don't like homemade biscuits and that sort of a thing, right? Uh, I've called these exchanges um, the aesthetic of kinship. They maintain the equanimity of a willing acceptance of everyday life while also gnawing away at the hinges on which it moves. Uh, in fact, there's a name in Punjabi for such emotions and in Urdu, and it's called uh, Vila, uh, which goes along with two other words, uh, Shikwa and Shikayat. Um, and the difference is that shikayat as a form of complaint is something which is levied towards somewhat distant people. You know, you could say, I did a shikayat to my teacher. Uh, shikwa and villa is primarily around modes of intimacy. And I give you, I mean, any cursory example from ordinary poetry. Uh, you know, nahi shikwa mujhe koi bevafai ka har gez gila to tab ho jo tumne kisi se bhi nibhai ho. Uh, that is, I have no villa. Uh, yeah, that is, I have no complaint about um, uh, ever about your faithlessness. Uh, I would have villa if you had been able to be faithful to anyone. Yeah? Uh, <laughs> that's right. So you get this notion of villa. And I have many examples. So I'll give you one other example of a woman who had, you know, complained about her sister-in-law that she had um, not visited her in hospital. Uh, and so because she had complained about it and the sister-in-law had heard about it, when she went to visit them, the sister-in-law did not come out of her room. And so uh, she said to me, I don't understand. She said, Apna samaj ki ta gila ki ta si na. Uh, Which means I, after all, it was because I thought of her as my own that I did gila. Uh, 
Now, the point I'm trying to make is that there's already in language a particular recognition of the, you know, of the dangers with which everyday life is fraught and the kind of work of everyday repair um, um, that you have to do. Uh, um, so, so with her sister-in-law, uh, she had a double complaint uh, that she had betrayed the intimacy twice over, firstly by not visiting her in hospital, and secondly by not even recognizing that her reproach was an expression of disappointment in love, not an impersonal complaint or a complaint born of family. So this question of what is disappointment in love is not only the great, you know, disappointing moments of uh, Leila and Majnu and so on, uh, there are also these disappointing moments of everyday life, and part of the notion of everyday life and its precarity is around the question of what sort of constant work of repair uh, would have to be done. Um, so I moved many years later. My mother-in-law was dying in an ICU of a hospital in Kolkata. Uh, I became panic-stricken when she suddenly began to demand cigarettes and a bottle of wine, putting a closed fist on her mouth as she said, fufu korbo, <laughs> uh, blowing imaginary <coughs> smoke and taking an imaginary bottle to her mouth. Theoretically, I knew about the ICU-produced psychosis, but I did not want any relatives to be in the vicinity of my mother-in-law in case I told myself they infer all kinds of things. My mother-in-law was a very pious person. Rules about purity and pollution were second nature to her. We were never allowed to touch eggs and then touch the milk, etc. So I consulted a priest who advised me, this is self-confession too, um, to take a small piece of fruit, have her touch it, then feed it to a cow. And because of the kind of locality we live in, Calcutta, it was very easy for me to smuggle a piece of apple in the ICU and have a touch it and then find a neighbor who has a cow and, you know, he would uh, actually eat it. And then the cravings actually disappeared. So I talked to the priest later and asked him why she had expressed such desires. She who had not stepped out of the house since my father-in-law died, she who had said that with his death all colour had gone out of her life when urged by us to wear not the stark white of a widow's sari but one with a slight dark border. The priest was very hesitant to say much. And this is part of the question of the occult because if you speak about a lot then you bring it about so you don't actually speak about it much. But he said there were many dark forces uh, which come to, uh, you know, which can come and enter the body. Uh, and thus become the bearer of the entity's desires, bound to it rather than to one's own karmas and one's own sanskaras. So the main thing that you, part of rituals, that you, it prevents you from becoming someone who carries the desire of another. Right? And I think this is actually very interesting because a lot of interviews that I've done with people about their experiences during the partition not of being victims, but also being like women who were, became, like this woman herself, who became very suspicious about what their brothers were doing, for example. Um, there was this, uh, this, this sense, like if you interview someone years later, he says, I can't recognize that I was that kind of person, that I could have become that. And that I don't, I've argued elsewhere that carrying the desire of the nation in you, for example, might dispossess you of your own self. And so there's a very interesting connection between this notion which appears in everyday life and the notion which might appear in moments of great uh, precarity of the sort in which you actually become dispossessed of yourself. Um, so, you know, in one way I'm trying to say that there is a certain brutality to everyday life. So those who've argued that somehow everyday life is very beautiful in my uh, analysis, I think are quite mistaken. My point is that both um, uh, the, um, you know, the aspect of everyday life that sustains us and the aspect of everyday life that destroys us are completely mixed in some ways with each other. So, for example, however much I am a scholar of death and of rituals, um, you know, I've read the Anteshti Sanskar, I've read the Garu Puran, I've written about them. And nevertheless, when rituals were being performed for my mother-in-law, and every time the word Preta was added, the ghost was added to her name, it was like somebody had hit me with something that, you know, that someone like that could be rendered as a ghost. I mean, I know theoretically this is temporary, this is just a ritual. But it's in a certain sense the brutality with which uh, everyday life can, you know, come to attack you. Um, 
Okay, so um, I come to the, uh, so this is one very, you know, interesting question for me as to how is it that one takes moments of this kind and the manner in which they flow into everyday life or are fenced off, blocked from the way in which we might think about everyday life. So um, um, uh, I move to the question really over here of um, um, uh, Paula Marathi in commenting on uh, Cavell's Little Did I Know uh, says very insightfully that the question about prophecy is not that we want to know the future, but that we want to know what is the world we live in, because that is what is actually fenced off uh, from us. So what is truly mysterious then, she says, is not the contents of such truths, but why they are and remain surprising to us. The problem of knowledge they raise, therefore, is not how knowledge can successfully explore, conceptualize, or categorize the world and its objects, humans included, but how knowledge eludes us, how we manage not to know what a sense we cannot fail to know. That, it seems to me, is the precise definition of precarity that I would might, might, might actually offer, which is to say we fail to, um, uh, uh, to know what we, you know, that we manage not to know what, in a sense, we cannot fail to know. Um, so, um, one aspect of this is, of course, um, uh, you know, not um, not knowing the other. But the other uh, thing that I try to do is, in what kind of sense, the problem is also of the opacity of the self. The fact that whose desires am I carrying is something which might not be clear uh, to oneself. Um, so I, um, that's one part. The other part is, of course, the opacity of self is also the opacity of experience. Um, and we can go to Emerson, um, who talks in a justly famous paragraph on his inability to mourn the death of his son, Waldo, where he says, there are moods in which we court suffering in the hope that here at least we shall find reality, sharp peaks and edges of truth, but it turns out to be scene painting and counterfeit. The only thing grief has taught me is to know how shallow it is, that like all the rest, it plays on the surface and never introduces me into reality for contact with which we could even pay the costly price of sons and lovers. In the death of my son, now more than two years old, I seem to have lost a beautiful estate. No more, it cannot get it nearer to me. It appears astonishing that, that, that um, Emerson is mourning here the loss of his ability to experience reality rather than the loss of his son. And Sharon Cameron writes to say that here mourning does its work by attaching that particular mourning of the death of the son to everything. So his life is then infused with a certain kind of mourning. Uh, and Quell does a very uh, fantastic form, you know, uh, interpretation of this to say that the even darker grief is the fact that the, um, that the philosopher is born out of this particular grief. So he reads the essay on experience as both a grave in which the, the memory of the sun is buried, but also it's pregnant with the idea of generating concepts, which he says are diminutive, you know, which are presented in opposition to the grand concepts of Kant. So I will not go into the philosophical aspects over here, but I do take uh, from here, um, the question really over here that what is it for Cavell to say that um, that out of this inability to touch experience is born the philosopher's birth into philosophy. And instead we could ask what does it mean that we might be fenced off from our own experience of loss? That is to say our inability to actually experience our own loss, which seems to me to be the central, a very central point in, um, uh, in uh, Emerson. Um, and I go on to talk in relation to that, to something which looks quite the opposite, which is Cheryl Mattingly's uh, compelling uh, ethnography about how parents um, Afri in uh, African-American families um, uh, talk about the death of, or, or even the lives and deaths of terminally ill children. Uh, and she says that what she's presenting is a first person um, uh, rendering of experience, which she then contrasts with the third person experience, which is, you know, what the public health nurse or the doctor might be able to say. And one of the very compelling things in her argument is the fact that there are people able to present 
contesting metaphors to the con to the metaphors of the doctors. So the, the doctor says this child is only a vegetable. You should now be removing the um, uh, the life support. Um, in one of the very compelling stories, the mother says, "Well, if she's the vegetable, we will be her garden." Right, and. Mettingly presents this as first-person narratives. What I've tried to argue is that actually what is very interesting in her thing is the fact that those who could not cope with it, those who were not up to the task, so there were husbands who divorced their wives, couldn't cope with it. There were people who really just did not want to do anything with it. So only one or two relative parents were left to actually deal with it. They are actually you know, out of the frame because they are not... Uh, you know, they're not interesting and admirable enough, and I can understand that. That you know, the stories of those who did cope with it are far more compelling. However, it seems to me that there is an underlying redemptive narrative over here of the sort in which, and it's very infused with Christian notions of I was an alcoholic, now look what I am in to the act of caring for the child. Uh, so I contrast it with um, some of the narratives in my own book on affliction, and I may recall here the story of Billu, uh, who's, uh, you know, what's happened in the slums in Delhi is that as technology has expanded, obligations have expanded. So earlier you wouldn't think that if you were a poor person, you, you weren't compelled to think about a kidney transfer for a son, right, or tra kidney transplant for a son, uh, for a brother. And I give this example of this man who, you know, the combination of a bit of scientism of the state and of you know patrons so that he can it is within the realm of possibility that he can get a kidney transplant for his brother but no one has told me how told him how expensive it would be to have immunosuppressants or to get even dialysis before the actual transplant is done and i show how in the process of dealing with his own brother um, you know, his newborn son dies because he has no, you know, he just hasn't paid attention to him. And there is, I describe the appearance of a goddess who can't be placed in the calendar at all. She's, you know, she can't be placed in the pantheon. She's a completely unknown goddess who has earlier was the village goddess, but now has been displaced, who commands him to actually move from the care of his brother to the care of his son. And this might be read as a certain psychological uh, you know, permission to himself to do that. Uh, but what seems to me really very interesting in this is that, um, uh, you know, that I argue that uh, that he was in a way presented with two different modalities of the occult world. One was the occultness of the technology of uh, uh, of um, uh, organ transplants. I mean, one forgets that that's exactly as occult as the. Um, you know, as the technology of gods and goddesses who appear before him and get him to be reattached to life. Um, the point about this in contrast to uh, Mattingly was the sense that um, I have this acute sense of the unhomely within the scene of the domestic. So really no one comes out unscathed. I mean, you know, no one comes out thinking that we've really been able to do the right thing. And Mattingly and I had a long conversation on this because, uh, I, I mean, the best I can offer is a certain kind of second chances to say, you know, can people then nevertheless repair something of what has been lost, which was my notion about the question of everyday life itself um, as a mode of, uh, how much time do I have? Uh, five minutes. Okay. And the habitation. So the last point I want to come is on the first person or the self as opaque. Um, you know, I start with the discussion of Anscom, who has a lovely thought experiment to show that, um, you know, she her argument is that the first person is not a pronoun at all. That is, we can't think of it as actually replacing a noun, right? Uh, and her argument is that I may know myself through a third person kind of way. I know my name is, I know, you know, where I live, I know, I can give you all facts about myself. But that, that's very different from reporting on myself in relation to whether I feel pain, whether I feel grief, whether I feel, you know, I don't have to search myself to be able to say that. But also the self is not one object among the others. I mean, I don't say, oh, where have I placed myself and then try and find myself. You know, that's not, I mean, that would only be a very skeptic uh, scene of madness in which I have to go around searching for myself, right? 
Uh, nevertheless, this notion that I might be dispossessed of myself is si simultaneously very, very interesting and very important. Uh, so I look at this opacity of the first person and in what kind of way does the grammatical structure, the triadic grammatical structure, uh, reveal both the opacity of the self in very interesting ways and a certain structure of responsiveness. That is, I revisit Abhinav Gupta, who is the 13th century commentator on Anandvardhan, and is a Shiva uh, tantric mystic himself, um, where he, you know, his, um, uh, it's a longish technical, somewhat technical definition. But Benvenis had a classical um, notion to say that the you know, uh, first person is the speaker, second person is the addressee, third person is that which is not addressed but spoken about and therefore can merge into non-person. Of course, I realized that this definition is completely, literally that of Abhinav Gupta's actually, right? Um, so that in Abhinav Gupta, this is formulated at the point of uh, Sheva um, Tantrism, so the particular words he interprets is Devi Shrinu, uh, Goddess Listen. And then he says that uh, in Sanskrit, interestingly, interestingly, what is third person is first person, what is second person is the medium person, what is the first person is the Uttam Purush, which might be the supreme person or the last person, right? But in the Shiva mode, this is equated with the Uttam Purush being Shiva, the second person being Shakti, and the third person being man. And there is this double sense to say that man might, you know, he, if, as long as there is an ego consciousness, it's an insentient being, rather than assuming that the speaker is in fact sentient. And it's only through the mode of address that he becomes sentient. So I argue that there is a structure of responsiveness which comes up with Avinav Gupta. I don't think it's present in Panini. Uh, so that there are movements within the tradition. It's not like I would say, oh, here's one Indian tradition and here's a Western tradition. They're huge conflicts, in fact. They're not formulated as conflicts, which is very interesting. Uh, but you do get a fairly different way in which one might think about, about that. Uh, so that... Um, Looking at something like the grammatical uh, persons, the fact that there's a fluidity of the third person, uh, of the three persons, uh, moves into aesthetic theory by asking how is it that I can feel the emotion of another. That is not a question of empathy, it's not a question of sympathy, it's that if an actor who is, let's say, acting Hamlet, is already portraying something you know, of emotions that he hasn't happened in his own life, and yet he becomes a transmitter to me. I can weep when I'm looking at Hamlet, or I can touch madness when I think about, you know, think about Hamlet. So that it ends with a certain notion that being or belonging is, it's not just a question of we belong or we do not belong, but that the, the, the double of belonging is a ghostly belonging. That is to say where uh, you know, my belonging is of the sort in which I am um, really carrying the uh, desires of another, and that it's only through the process of address and responsiveness that that particular desire might be um, taken. Though I have some very nice ethnographic examples, uh, but in the end it becomes like, you know, that when we then think about our culture, we can think about it as a gift, but we can also think about it giving us the words through which we may rebuke it. Uh, and this is, I think, very uh, important um, in, in many ways to say um, that the question is really, do I want to, and what does it mean to be occupying the space which my culture has prepared for me, right? And here... Uh, Favorite Sada's wonderful descriptions of bewitching, uh, in which he shows that uh, you know that the head of the farm family has no disposition for being some of sometimes has no disposition for being the head of the family. That is, he doesn't want to be, you know, slaughtering his brothers and putting all the women in place, right? Uh, but through the process of um, uh, notions of witchcraft, the idea that misfortunes are falling on the farm. Uh, because the head of the farm is not up to his task, lead in a certain sense to very subtle ways in which a particular channel, she says, to evil is opened up. And this channel to evil is nothing else but becoming this happy head of, uh, happy head of the farm. Uh, so we are left with a very dark vision in a certain sense that what looks like a solution is precisely where the violence in a certain sense of the everyday 
uh, might lie. And so in conclusion, you might say, um, I have two minutes or probably one minute left. Um, so um, I, mean, I compare this with Krishna standing, uh, although Fevisada is very clear that, no, this is only about farm family. I think she really wants it to be, um, I mean, I, I think that there are risks Clearly, it's also speaking about something larger because her own psychic reality does not remain unaffected. The fact that if it was only for the head of the farm family, she would not have gone through life completely. I mean, the field work completely transformed what her life was really about in some ways, right? Um, so, uh, uh, so I argue that you know you have exactly this particular set of issues of how is it that my life can become uh, occult to me. Uh, and I conclude, conclude here with, um, uh, with the example of a great Muslim healer, Amel, who a great friend of mine, and I describe him in, uh, in my book, Affliction. Uh, one of the interesting things is that his grandfather, who was uh, even greater Amel, this guy didn't want to be an Amel. He had to become an Amel through various sort of things that fell upon the family. Uh, but uh, his grandfather, one of the most interesting thing is that his grandfather get caught into the scene. You know, he has, he's a very pious man, so he commands two jinns who are, you know, dutiful and uh, present to him because of his piety. Uh, but he also gets entangled with a particular ghost named Padmini, uh, who, um, you know, who conjures up during a period, and he could have finished her off, but he gets too lured by her. That is, it's very clear in the story uh, that, it, that he himself gets very attached to her. But if you then see the story, very interestingly, Padmini is, you know, is precisely the kind of forces in a certain sense of unmastered forces of history of very difficult Hindu-Muslim kinds of relationships. So Padmini is the name um, of the um, you know of the heroine in um, in this oh. medieval romance called Padmavat, um, uh, and the story has had a huge impact upon the way that Hindu-Muslim relations and especially women are thought about. But there's one particular instance when, at the last moment, when she has fulfilled a particular promise. It's a very complicated story before a Guru Maharaj. Um, uh, and the Guru Maharaj says, you, you, you've done it, you've suffered a lot, shall we now perform your funeral for you? And she says, even you cannot do it because you do not know whether, uh, and, and Hafid Mia says, I don't know whether she was the princess Padmini or whether she was the forces through which, uh, you know, all the uh, atrocities which were done upon women were the forces through which she came into being. Uh, right, so there is a sense in which uh, it seems to me that what the forces of life adds to the idea of forms of life is uh, precisely the fact of this unbidden, which I think is very present in Wittgenstein, to think not just what is intentional action, but also what comes unbidden and in what kind of way we might inherit the, you know, the uh, unmastered forces of our own. Um, histories and of our own societies, and to that extent, I think it provides a link between thinking why thinking about something like everydayness and thinking of the natural beyond biology um, might give us some kind of a clue uh, of how to think about um, uh, precarity. Because uh, you know, the last section which I'm not going to read was on Coetzee's novel on waiting for the barbarians. Um, in which one of the things become very clear that the magistrate has always lived by the law. He has not done anything, but he's completely complicit with the with the torture that happens. And when he's making, um, you know, he picks up this barbarian woman who's been tortured. And at one point, when he is sleeping with her, he says, um, you know. Uh, uh, why do, do you want to do this because you want it? And she says, yes. And he says, why do you want it? She says, because I have nowhere else to go. Uh, and he says that, uh, Kotsu says that there is a certain kind of make-believe language which can emerge in these particular moments, which is not the standing language of love, uh, 
which is why uh, you know I've thought of Balakrishnari force not just in the decorative statements of I love you as in Marion or even in Kaval, but what is it that goes much before and much after? Bidu calls those procedures of truth, but what goes before in a certain ten is precisely the kind of waiting. Um, uh, not of the sort necessarily that you describe, but that can be waiting of the sort in which precisely uh, the pellicutionary force is something which is diffused in a certain sense and might allow us to think of connections between the everyday life and not necessarily only in spaces of precarity, but what connects these different spaces. Thank you very much.